Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Greetings, good people. My name is Pete. I'm an alcoholic. Hey. I feel good to be here. My sobriety day is November 17th, 2010. Uh, I have a sponsor. His name is Ali. Uh, he knows he's my sponsor. When's your, when's your birthday? November 17th, 2010. And I have a home group. It's called uh, Sobriety on State and Date. We meet in Little Italy on Thursday nights. Uh, it's a good meeting. If you're in that part of town, come see us and check it out. Thank you for your uh, opening lead, Ed. And congratulations to the token takers. And uh, certainly welcome to the people who identify themselves as newcomers I always have a lot of respect for people who introduce themselves within the first 30 days of sobriety. I spent a lot of time coming in these rooms, and I would wait until I had 31 days to come back. So I didn't have to raise my hand and introduce myself. As well. <laughs> that's the kind of guy I am. Like, that's how big my ego is. Like, I will be out there uh, essentially dying, but, but I have too much pride to come and raise my hand that I'm a newcomer. So I have a lot of respect for people who do that. And um, this is a good-looking group. I don't say that every meeting I've been to, so... Y'all doing all right? <laughs> it's, um, you know, if you would have told me like 10 years ago, I'd be standing in a coat and tie in front of a room of distinguished San Diegans and uh, giving a, a presentation, I'd probably have been like, yes, yeah, sounds right. Sounds about right. Um, <laughs> you know, at, at an AA meeting, I probably would have had some choice word for you, but, you know, it's, um, this is certainly my home, and, um, and, and I feel very privileged and honored to be able to participate in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I certainly appreciate the invite from Larry and Joe. And uh, this is a good meeting. My, my great grand sponsor spoke here a while back, and there's a lot of history with the meeting, and, and it's a privilege to be a part of it. And uh, like our first speaker, I'll tell you in a little bit in a general way, you know, what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like today. And uh, I was raised in Montana from when I, when, when I was one to six. And the reason I mention that because I, I moved to D.C. when I was six years old. And uh, I remember getting out the family Astro van. And I had, uh, <laughs> I had a full denim get-up on, right? And I, and I get out in D.C. and, like, that shit didn't fly. And, uh, <laughs> and I learned real quick, man, like, that, you know, I kind of had to change and manipulate who and what I was and how I talked and how I introduced myself and how I carried myself to kind of be who I thought y'all wanted me to be. And that would be, a, uh, that would be an ongoing theme in my life. Uh, particularly as it relates to to uh, alcoholism, and you know, I spent a lot of time trying to be who I thought y'all wanted me to be, whether it was my family or my job or you know, girlfriends or whoever that was, and I, and uh, and I chased some identity that wasn't mine for a long time. I remember sitting on my dad's knee when I was probably like six or seven, and uh, like having a, a sip of his beer. I uh, remember that. I do not remember the first time I had Gatorade or orange juice or any of that, but I remember the first time I had a sip of beer. Now, I'm not saying that makes me an alcoholic, but, you know, it's an interesting, interesting recollection, right? <laughs> so needless to say, I didn't start, like, going off the charts then, but, uh, you know, I played athletics, and I was pretty good in school for a while. And, um, you know, those were deterrents to me being able to, like, really jump in to, to drinking. But, uh, but I drank when I could in high school, which was quite often, but... I hear people say, it's crazy, because nowadays people, you know, like, they're like, I started drinking quite late, like 17, and, uh, <laughs> you know, because there's people out there getting twisted at like 9, 10, 11 years old. I mean, it's nuts, you know, and, uh, you know, that's not my story. I mean, the thing about the new, the new people here, whether you're new to AA or new to this meeting or coming back, you know, I just hope that you hear something, whether it be right here from the podium, from my previous speaker and myself, or hopefully something before the meeting or after the meeting that's going to get you back here tomorrow. Or maybe even to another meeting tonight. Howlers, perhaps. There's a meeting in San Diego every night at midnight. There's something that started at 5.30. San Diego's a great place. Like, D.C., I got sober. There's hundreds and hundreds of meetings and thousands of meetings. And uh, we're so lucky to, to, uh, to be in a, in a place where sobriety is so, so opportune for us. You know, these pioneers of AAs, you get like two weeks in the 40s, and they like, put your ass on a train and go to Chicago to talk to somebody. You know, like, you're carrying the message. So I got 10 days, man. They're like, yep, go carry the message of AA. And I'm so lucky I could just get to show up to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I get to meet a lot of people. 
high school was very much like I think a lot of people, you know, I got in like a couple scrapes and, you know, this was pre-YouTube. Thank God, right? <laughs> Yo, I would be all over YouTube if that thing was around. I'm so lucky. You know, there were cell phones, but they had flips and not really good cameras. Uh, and pagers. I was around with pagers. I'm kind of dating myself a little bit. But we had pagers. Yeah, it was awesome. And the Zach Moore cell phones. Those were dope, too. But, I, you know, I, I got in trouble a couple of times. I got, like, a possession charge. I got, um, you know, kicked out of a few places and, you know, had some run-ins with my family and my friends. But nothing nothing that was going to definitely deter me from my drinking. You know, Bill talks about his story. You know, I, I, I forgot the, the warnings of my people about drink. And I had some of those, too. My mom and dad are both non-alcoholics. My older brother and my older sister are both non-alcoholics as well. Uh, we do have some alcohol, alcohols in our family. And I remember my parents would say, like, hey, man, you know, we got this thing in our family. Be careful. And I'd be like, cool, no problem. And then go out and, you know, do my drinking. So I never really paid too much. I'm like Bill a little bit. And I don't say that with a big heart or, you know, some bravado. But when I can read the, the literature and I can relate to the stories, particularly our founders, I say maybe I'm in the right place, you know. That was cool. <laughs> So I got out of high school, right, barely somehow, and uh, and I went to I went to um, a college to play soccer, and uh, on the East Coast, and uh, I played athletics at a pretty high level, um, and I, I I mentioned that because like I come from a great family, and I and I played athletics pretty high, and like I never really knew what it meant like to be like a uh, a part of a unit, you know. I know there's like, a lot of veterans in here. Thank y'all for your service. A lot of us come from good families. Some don't, you know. I don't think any of that necessarily makes us alcoholics or not or maybe potentially, you know, uh, uh, more likely to be. But there's been nothing that I've, that I've got in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, as far as brotherhood, companionship, understanding, family atmosphere. There's nothing. And that's not a slight on my family. It's just really an endorsement of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and really the community that we get to see here. It's unbelievable. But I mentioned that uh, that college because I went there. And uh, it was in Newark. Well, I was in South Orange, New Jersey. Okay, it was, uh, it was um, Seton Hall University. And it was right on the line from South Orange University, right next to Newark. And Newark is carjack capital of the world. And we used to get 40s and sit on the roof and watch car chases. And, uh, like, I always had a glass in hand, man. I always had drink. And, um, and, and my, my, my chest was so big that I went to the, to, the, to the coaches who, like, didn't even really recruit me. I was a walk-on. And I was like, I'm not getting the playing time, and I'm transferring. And they were like, who are you again? Um, <laughs> but, like, this, like that's, that's also, like, a team in my life. Like, oh, my God, I'm a two-hands-out kind of guy. You know what I mean? I was a, I was a baby child, you know, uh, the, the, the bottom of three. And, like, I... I have a, I had, and I, and I still can from time to time, like have some entitlement issues. Like, I think y'all need to give me things, you know, and I don't need to earn them or work for them. Like, I just would like you to give them to me because I'm me. That's why. I mean, is there better resident? You know, do I need more explanation here? And I, and I kind of treated relationships like that. And I certainly treated, um, family like that. And when I finally came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I treated Alcoholics Anonymous like that as well. You know, and I wanted y'all to give me sobriety. I didn't want to do a damn thing for it. I put a dollar in the basket. Isn't that good enough? And I drank the coffee. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing AA. <laughs> and I did that for years, you know, and I, I didn't get much. I'll tell a couple stories just because my friends will bust my balls if I don't, man. But I went to, uh, I went to four colleges, uh, in, in, I used to say getting my four year degree was the best eight years of my life. <laughs> and, <laughs> I lived in like 14 cities in uh, like over eight years. And I, I was a runner. And I, I want to tell you I was a runner. People are like, who, what are you running from? And I said, I like to travel, you know, and see things. <laughs> but really, like, everywhere I went, I just burned bridges and I didn't care, you know. I was, re I was at a meeting earlier today and we read Dr. Bob's Nightmare and he's like, I had no regard for who or what or why or when, how it affected you, what kind of impact it had on you. I was all about me. Now, I couldn't see that. And I certainly couldn't vocalize that, but that was definitely the way I was living my life. And uh, I went, um, like I said, I had a couple of, like run-ins with the law. Um, I drove from. Uh, I was 24 years old, and I and I got I, I bought I bought my uh, car from my parents, 
which means I, you know, I just took it and told him I was going to pay for him later. <laughs> and I drove across the country to Colorado, and I was like, I'm going to start my life again. Right? Now, like, I was already in the throes of alcoholism for sure, you know. And I can relate to the literature which says, like, you know, long before we came to Alcoholics Anonymous, we knew that our drinker was more than mere habits, you know. I knew that. I mean, I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew I could not take one drink and control it. I was just not willing to do anything about it. You know, I became understanding, like, look, this is the hand I was dealt. This is the way my life is. I would just power through it, somehow get it done. You know, I'll find lower companions. And, um, and I did that, too. But I drove across the country to uh, Boulder, Colorado. I was there for three days. And uh, I was going like, to move in with, like, one of my buddies there. And he, and, uh, he was a dealer, and, but he went to school. And I was like, I'm going to start my life over. I had these grandiose ideas about, like, how things are going to happen. Like, I'm that dude that's going to meet a person at the bar and, like, change both of our lives tonight. <laughs> you know? And, like, I don't have any money or ideas, but, like, it's going to happen. Like, I leave my house with those ideas, like, constantly. And, uh, and I, I drove across the country, and I was there for, like, eight hours. And, uh, like, we went out, and we all got drunk, and they all went to sleep. And, uh, and I got in my car and started driving around, like, the city I didn't know. And... Um, and I, and I know the, the the following events by reading the police report because I don't remember it. Right, so you know if you if you wake up in jail and you have to figure out what happened by reading the police report, like, you might be in the right place too. And uh, <laughs> but I'm going the one way down a wrong way street in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, they put the lights on. You know they, they try and light me up and I take off. Right in my Saturn. Right? <laughs> So it was a medium speed chase, right? <laughs> but they, like, we're in a residential area, so they call it a chase off, you know, for safety reasons, right? So they call it a chase off, and then they're like, I guess they keep driving, and they find me like a mile down the road, and two of my wheels are off the car. Yeah. And, uh, and they come up to the passenger side door, and I'm sitting in there, and it's uh, February in Boulder, Colorado, so I had one of those big jackets on with the fur around the hood. And I'm sitting in my car like this. I'm just in the car, not moving. And they knock on the door, and they open the door. And again, I read this from the police report. They're like, sir, have you been drinking? And I motion with my head to the passenger side seat, and there's a bottle of Jack with a seatbelt on it. <laughs> I love alcohol, you know? I'm concerned about it. And I make sure it has a safe voyage. And uh, so needless to say, they took me to jail. Right, and uh, and I was in Boulder County Jail for 28 days, and I um, there were some other charges. Normally, they don't keep you for 28 days on a DUI, right? But I had felony eluding and a couple other things, and um, so I went into a program called the Phoenix Program, and uh, and that was for drug and alcohol offenders who like wanted to change their lives. Now, here's the thing: I damn sure didn't want to change my life. I just did not want to be in general population. <laughs> I'm not a G-pop guy, you know? And, like, even though, like, I would kind of be a tough guy back in the day, I mean, I have to mention this, man, too, because it's like an ego shot. My, my sponsor always reminds me, he's like, people can relate more to your, your deficiencies and your, and your defects they can to, than, than your suit, you know? And um, I'm, I'm that guy who used to carry guns, like, w without clips, without ammo. <laughs> like, seriously, again, like, that's who I am, you know? So, like, I'm a fake tough guy, and I was for a long time. So I get to jail, and I'm like... Phoenix program, yes. You know, G-pop, no. Get me in there. So I'm in there, and that's where I went to my first meeting about Call Anonymous. And the guy brought a, a meeting in. It was an H&I. And, &I, and um, I was baffled to learn that he was not affiliated with the judicial system or the courts or the police or the sheriff or anything else. And uh, he told us he was going to, like, leave that night, and he wasn't getting paid to be there. And I was like, this is crazy. And um, But I have a very special part, place in my heart from H&I &I because that's where I, I, I first – Went to an AA meeting. I got a book in that meeting, and I brought it back with me, and uh, and I stayed in jail for 28 days, and I got out, and I had to go do two breathalyzers a day, and I had to start doing the AA meetings, and uh, and I got drunk two days later. Um, you know, gun laws in Colorado are a little different, and we were in the woods with AKs, like with banana clips, like, and I'm, I have like a house arrest rate bracelet on, and I had to go do two breathalyzers a day, and I'm getting drunk in the woods. Um, like it, that used to be a really funny story and, uh, it's still kind of funny, but it's just ridiculous, you know?
It's ridiculous when I have overwhelming evidence in my in my face that says like this is what happens when you drink again and then you do again, and uh, like I cannot wrap my head around a first step because I don't think that I've lost the power of choice to drink. I say I'm not going to drink, and then two or three hours later I say I'm going to drink and see what happened is, is I changed my mind. I'm not powerless. I changed my mind, <laughs> <laughs> and I held on to that for a long time. And um, I got all those uh, charges transferred back to D.C. So I could, you know, like, again, the tough guy joy, right? So I move into mom and dad's place, right? That's what I do. <laughs> and they're like, no lying, no, steal, no, no stealing, no drugs, no alcohol. Go to meetings, go to therapy. And I'm like, word, I got it all. Let's do it. And um, and I, and I kind of half-assed my way in AA for a long time. I used to come to meetings just like this and, and other meetings, too, you know, like small meetings, like discussion groups. Right, and they would go around the room, and they would introduce themselves, and I would raise my hand, and I'd say, "My name's Pete. I'm an alcoholic," and I had zero idea what that meant. You know, the truth was, I just didn't want y'all to come talk to me at the meeting, and um, you know, an honest desire to stop drinking. Nah, man, like honestly, just sign my course slip, and I did that for six years, man. <laughs> that, honest, an honest desire to stop drinking. Right? It says that. So, if you read the preface in our book, right, and some of the opening. Uh, it says that originally, right? The only requirement is an honest desire to stop drinking, right? You read it now in the preamble, it says the only requirement is a desire to stop drinking. They dropped that word honesty. Now, I'm not sure. I didn't talk with Bob and Bill, but I have my understandings about why they might do that, right? It's to be more inclusive to guys like me who have no idea how to be honest and don't even know what it means to, like, honestly want to stop drinking. I didn't know what that meant. And I got all those, trans- those charges transferred back to D.C., and I was, like, going to AA a little bit, but not really. And, uh, and I got those results, too, you know. I went back to school. I went and got an associate's degree. Because I can, like, you know, uh, I, can, like, I can kind of dress up from time to time, you know, and, like, put on a good face and get some things done and kind of, like, wade through life, just barely getting by. And, uh, and I can do that in AA, too, you know, and I've done that as well. And, uh, and I got my associate's degree, and I transferred to the Ohio State University. And... Um, and I went up there because a girl I was dating at the time. And I used to, I was 27 when I got my bachelor's degree. But from 24 to 27, I, showed, I was in college. And I would show up to English 101 just like this. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> and, uh, like, I'd be sitting next to freshmen with, like, Hello Kitty slippers on. <laughs> and I'd be like, it was, it, was, it was just a goon, man. It was crazy. And, uh, and I worked full-time at, at, uh, at, a, at a job that allowed me to do a lot of drinking. And, um, and, and I took, like, 27 credits. Like, I was in school, and I was going hard with the drink, big time. And, um, and, and I'll tell this story, too, because it's just an indication of kind of who I am. I used to get up on Tuesday. It's like I, I used to love day drinking, you know, like 11 a.m. Like, that's my sweet spot. And uh, I used to get on the bus, right, like this. Right, in a suit that I like borrowed from my dad or something. And I would get on the bus and go to like the swanky part of uh, Columbus, Ohio. It's called Short North at the time. And um, I would go into like some like upper class lounge or something, right? And I got, I'm, I'm pretty broke, but I would get like some top shelf drink, keep going, bartender, you know, all the way up there, that one, yes. And I sit at the bar by myself with a newspaper. And like pretend to read the Wall Street Journal and make fake phone calls. <laughs> like, yo, ten thousand is not enough. You tell him twenty thousand or nothing at all. <laughs> I swear to God, right? And I'm like looking around to see who sees me. You know? And I give my one drink, you know, and it's eighteen dollars. <laughs> You know, so I give him, you know, I give him, I give him twenty because I got a tip. You know, I got. I mean, I get back on the bus and I go home and I dig through my couch for like, you know, change so I can get forties to, you know, finish the job. <laughs> I'm, I have this thing, man, where I'm so concerned about what y'all think about me. You know, I don't know that. I can't really say that. I can't verbalize that. I learn that when I come here, particularly through some inventory, and I start really taking a look at who what, and what I am. Right. I went to a. I went to a. Uh, um, so I've been mean, like, I, you know, I was going to counselors for a little bit during my life, man. There's not, no, there's nothing to take away from counselors, right? I mean, Alcoholics Anonymous clearly states like we seek outside help from time to time, and I would go see counselors. And I went to a counselor when I was in college, and I was like, oh, I think I had a drinking problem, and I had some problems. And he, like, I went back and saw him again, and 
And uh, we chat a little bit. And he's like, you know what? He's like, you know, I think you, I think you're good, man. I think you got this. And I was like, I think you're right, you know. <laughs> and it's nothing against him. It's just against, or you know, it's it's a it's a, it's a pretty clear cut indication about how non-alcoholics maybe are not so skilled in the area of helping alcoholics. Maybe they can't understand because they're not there, right? And that's on me because I was going to meetings where there was certainly resources to help me. I was just unwilling to listen because I was going to people and hear what I want to hear, right? So this guy says, you got it. And I says, you know, you damn right I got it. And uh, and I got twisted for a long time. And um, I left Ohio State, man, and uh, my brother was... Um, my brother had just finished up getting his, his master's degree, and I just got my degree, and we both had uh, like jobs that were ending and school that were ending, and we drove around the country for like six and a half weeks. I did a lot of drinking, man. It was crazy. And, uh, and we, you know, we decided to move to San Diego, and I moved here, and um, I got a job, and I had a girlfriend, and she had a Audi A6, and, and she uh, I dropped her off at work, and then... Uh, I went to go watch football. It was Sunday. And I wasn't real used to the 10 a.m. start times, you know what I mean? And I threw up my drinking a little bit. I got a little twisted too quick, you know? And I got a DUI over there on Hotel Circle, the overpass in Mission Valley. I work there now. I have to drive over that joint every day. It's a, it's a great reminder. And I got my second DUI. Now, DUIs do not mean you're an alcoholic either. Like, I love that stuff. I meet, I meet like, newcomers in AA, and I'm like, what brings you here? And they say, I'm an alcoholic. And I say, well, I know, sometimes I ask them, are you an alcoholic? And they're like, they scoff. <laughs> you know, what do you think I'm doing here? I'm like, oh, all right. You know, and they say, I got a DUI. And I say, that's cool. You know, like, that doesn't mean you're an alcoholic. I mean, I mean, that might mean that you make, like, foolish decisions when you drink, you know. But getting a DUI, in my opinion, I mean, you know, I don't ask your sponsor, but I don't think that makes you an alcoholic at all, you know. I made a lot of really dumb decisions when I drink. I typically, I typically do that, but that doesn't necessarily diagnose my, my malady or my condition or anything else. But the reason why I mentioned that story is because I got out of jail downtown. I know a lot of y'all here are familiar with that place. Yeah. Particularly that section over there probably, right? <laughs> I get out of jail, and I lost my job, right, because I couldn't show up. And, uh, and I told my girlfriend's A6. That was bad news. And um, I get out of jail, and I'm walking away from jail, and I'm like, damn, like, things hit the fan again, you know. And I went to the liquor store, and then I went to the hotel, and I drew the, I drew the you know, the, the blind shut, and then there I was. Again and again in my life, like, my solution to life happening on my own accord is to get drunk. And... um Still, I'm not convinced I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. These are just a couple stories, man. If you can relate to that, it's cool. And if you can't, that's cool too, man. Hopefully you talk to some people here, right? But I had been going to Alcoholics Anonymous for six years. Um, so I was unemployable. Uh, my girlfriend was like, yo, we, we got to be done here and good for her. That's happened a couple of times in my life. And uh, so, so you know, again, the tough guy. So I went back home into mom and dad's place, man. And um, and they're same thing. They were like, "Man, you're a mess, dude." And you know, they they, they wanted me to go to AA again. And I, I kind of started doing that. And I got one more story, and it talks about in the literature. It's like we're absolute genius for getting tight at the wrong time or the right time, whatever you want to say, right? And um, so I had uh, I was going to AA a little bit, right? And I was showing up, and I definitely didn't have a sponsor. But I'll go to the meetings and I'll put a dollar in a basket. And again, like that was my idea of doing alcoholics and I miss. Like I will put a dollar in a basket and I would drink the coffee. And if you call on me, I'll probably ramble some stuff. And then I'll tell people I'm in AA. And uh and I like and I thought I was doing alcoholics and I like I truly was like, I'm doing AA. Like I'm a member of AA. Uh, it's hilarious. And um my brother was still living in San Diego at the time, and uh, I'm a drunk dialer. There's some of y'all in here, too, that can relate to that, right? But again, because I'm, like, all about me, so, I, like, I get real twisted to why I can't remember it, and I start calling, and you need to hear what I got to tell you. And, uh, and I called my brother drunk, and he was like, oh, man, like, this is this is it, bro. Like, I got I to gotta tell mom and dad. Or, no, he was like, if, if this happens another time, I got to tell mom and dad. And he was coming home from San Diego, and I had a job somehow. It's a miracle. I was there for, like, a week. And, uh, and I was leaving that job. It was in Wheaton, Maryland. 
and uh, and we were going to a steakhouse. Right? My brother was coming to town. My mom, my dad were like, we're going to take our two sons out to steak dinner. And uh, and I come out of work. I'm getting on the metro. It's like our trolley, but you know, a real train, you know. And um, and uh, and I'm not thinking twice, and I go right into a bar. I had no idea or thought. Or, or, or anything I said, don't do that, you know? And I wasn't like, I'm going to go get drunk or like, I'm going to sneak this in. It was just like, I was oblivious to the fact. And I went into the bar and I got my, my standard drink with two shots, Grand Moyer, two beers. And I hit all four of them, pow, 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 pow. And I got on the train and I, and I get out the train and I can see the steakhouse. It's like 60 yards away. And I'm walking to the steakhouse and I go to the next bar and I get the same round. And I go into the steakhouse and I sit down with my family. And, I'm, and my mom and dad are like, our two, our two sons with a joyous event. And my brother's like, you can see it in my eyes. I get the crazy eye. You know, one gets a little droopy. <laughs> <laughs> but my parents didn't know. But my brother knew immediately, you know. And, um, and, and, and here's another kicker. On the way home from that dinner, I had them drop me off at a meeting about Alcoholics Anonymous. Because, again, like, I'm just such a front, you know. Like, I'm just such a front that... I'll do and say whatever you want me to say if it would, if it would I think you want to hear. Which will bring me to the steps, too, man, because I, I, I'm i not one who kind of flies through the steps, man. You know, somebody asks, are you powerless over alcohol? I say, yeah, yeah, I'm powerless. Let's go step two. You know? And it doesn't work like that for me. I'm in sales by trade. I don't know if y'all can tell. But, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, so like, I'm, 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 I'm kind of good at, like, you know, telling you what you want to hear. And... Um, my brother dropped dime on me to my parents. God, I love him for that. I didn't for a long time. He was all over the four-step. Very resentful at the cat. But, uh, you know, my, my, my family had to kick me out. My dad, I see my dad. My dad, uh, he's a strong dude, man. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's a hardworking dude, veteran. And I've seen him cry two times in his life. And once when his dad died, and there are times when he had to kick me out of his house. And uh, my dad was crying, and my mom was, you know, broken. And I took my two trash bags, and I was like, I don't need y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked out. And I walked out, and, um, you know, God bless him for that, too, man. Like, if you got, I don't know, I think we're probably all members of AA here, but if you're, you know, al Anon or a family or friend, sometimes you got to lovingly detach, I've been taught. You know, and I, I can't imagine how hard that was for my family, uh, we since had countless talks about it, but I love him for it. I love my brother for it, too. I was very upset with him at the time. Which brings me to getting into treatment, you know, and starting really my path along uh, uh, sobriety um, in my time, you know, that I've, I've accumulated this time. And um, my, my dad was going out of town, so he kicked me out, and he was going out of town on a business trip to Africa. And uh, so he was gone, man. So, again, man, like, just like we don't realize the kind of torment that we cause in people's lives. Who here is like me that shows up and says, my drinking didn't hurt anybody, just me, you know? And like, what a bunch of bullshit that is, you know? But I don't realize that either. I have no idea about the effects I have on other people. I don't realize that my defects actually provoke the defects of others. But I'm quick to point yours out. You know, I can see how you messing up, and I'm not really sure about how much, you know, I helped, you know, aggravate that. That's not my problem, though. I can see why you're a problem, though. And, uh... My dad went to Africa, and I called my mom. It was November 15th of 2010, and it was uh, chilly in D.C., and it was raining, and I had sweatpants on, and I was below a payphone in a puddle. Picture it. It's real. I was in a puddle with sweatpants on, and I was crying with snot bubbles. <laughs> and I called my mom, and I was like, yo, I need help. I need help, Mom. And... um God bless her. You know what I'm saying? Now, here's the, here's the funny thing, too. I am positive, and I've talked to my dad since, and if he was not, if he was in town, there's no damn way that she would have came and got me. My mom loves me. So does my dad immensely. But they love me enough to, like, not, you know, be done with my stuff. You know what I mean? So my mom came and picked me up, and, um, and I slept on the couch for two days until I went into a, uh, a facility for the alcoholically insane. Some people call it treatment centers. And um, <laughs> listen, they took my belt and my shoelaces, so I don't know what that was per se. <laughs> but I went into that that that, uh, that facility, and then people from what would become my home group would start uh, showing up to that meeting. 
And again, that's why I have a lot of love for H and I commitments. And I started meeting people and I started hearing things. And I, I got out of that treatment center and I was like, I'm gonna go get my life back on track and get a car and a girlfriend and a job. And the people at the treatment center were like, We don't think that's a good idea. Maybe I'd move into sober living. <laughs> now the reason I mentioned that because it wasn't my idea. But for some reason I had a little bit of willingness and I went into a a halfway house. And I went into a halfway house for six months. And when I was at that halfway house, I started going to more meetings with the home group that I got at the time, and I started meeting people in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I met a man. His name was Ali. I, I saw him in a couple of meetings. Now, here's a, I have a, I've been very, very blessed to walk with some men through the, through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, there's some meetings, like my home group, where they ask, anybody want to be a sponsor? Hey, you raise your hand. If you got some time and you want to be a sponsor, yeah, I'll do it. And I tell people, like, you know how many times I've got a sponsee from raising my hand in a meeting? Zero. Say that, say that again. Zero times have I got a sponsee from raising my hand in a meeting to say I'm available to sponsor. Maybe your experience is different, but that's not how it goes with me. My experience is similar to one I had with my sponsor, right? He came up to me. He introduced himself to me at a meeting. He, he extended his hand. He got my name and my number. And the next day he called me, and that's how I was doing. And um, that's what I try and do today. I remember one time, like three months sober, my sponsor, no, maybe like six months sober, my sponsor was like, you talking to new guys? I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to new guys. I gave my, my sponsor to a new guy, or my, my phone number to a new guy. He's like, what the hell are you giving your number to a new guy for? He's like, new guy don't know how to call you. <laughs> <laughs> you could, he said, you got to call a new guy. Right? You know, in those six and a half years, you know how many hundreds of numbers of Alcoholics Anonymous members I had on my phone that I never called? You know how many times I got calls from members of Alcoholics Anonymous over those six years? Quite often. You know? I wasn't even sober. People are like, hey, what's up, man? And they're not like trying to AA me down. What step are you on, bro? They're like, what's up, man? How are you? How, how's things? Yeah? It's not good, huh? Yeah. <laughs> But they called, man, you know. I used to show up to places with, like, a ton of cash, like, go to my favorite bars. And they were like, you can't come in here, man, you know. Like, there was no more options for me, man. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous works a lot better for people who are out of options. And if you're not options, that's cool because maybe you're just, uh, maybe you're alcoholic, maybe potential alcoholic. Come check it out, right. The point of all that is to say that I didn't, I didn't get any results in Alcoholics Anonymous until I really actually, like, came and participated, you know. Like, that's such a big kicker for me in Alcoholics Anonymous', Alcoholics Anonymous is participation. And it's more than just showing up, right? I always equate it to, um, like, fitness. I think a lot of us can maybe relate to fitness either when we were younger or today. And here's my deal. So I buy a gym membership, and I go to the gym. And I sit in the lobby, and I put a towel around my shoulders, and I probably even drink a protein shake. But I just sit there. Right. And I do that again and again and again every day. And I see people walking in and walking out and like they're getting fit and I'm not getting fit. And I'm like, this gym sucks. This gym doesn't work. <laughs> right. The gym doesn't work. And they say, well, you know, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm here. I've been sitting. I've been coming every day. <laughs> and, uh, and I treat alcoholics and I'm like that. And, you know, maybe you're like me. Maybe you sit in the back with your hat low and you drink the coffee. And you tell your mom or your sister or your boyfriend or the judge that you're doing Alcoholics Anonymous. And maybe you are. I don't know. I wasn't. You know? I wasn't. And uh, I got a sponsor who didn't really take any, any, any you know, he was, he was, he was, I, I tell stories about him a lot. And people are like, man, that guy sounds like a beast. You know, he's like, he's rough. And he's like the most gentle, loving human being, uh, you know, I've met, man. But, but like, he, he was like not. He was not listening to a bunch of my stories anymore, you know. And we got on board real quick. And um, <laughs> yeah, I love him for it, man. I moved out. I, I moved to uh, San Diego for a year and a half sober. Uh, and I have seven today. And, and, and Ali's still my sponsor. And people, I, I show up to San Diego and they're like, you know, I'm, I'm new. I've been here before. I know some people in the rooms. And, you know, but I'm, I'm kind of new. And, you know, people are trying to, like, do what they do and, like, swoop and, like, sponsor people, right? I love it. And they're like, hey, how much time you got? I'm like, yeah, like a year and a half. They're like, cool, you got a sponsor? I'm like, yeah, he's back in D.C. They're like, oh, you need a local sponsor. And I'm like, thank you for your opinion, you know? But, like, the old me is like, like, you want to talk about this outside, about what I need, you know? Like, I can tell you what I need, and, you know, I'm going to tell you what you're going to get, you know? But, <laughs> but I was kind of taught differently, particularly, you know, in that humbling process of doing four and five. You know, I remember uh, my sponsor is... Um, He's like, 
he helps me understand that I'm a, a selfishness is the root of my problem. You know, our first speaker talked about it, and I start trying to wrap my head around that, and I go up into my halfway house, my single room, right, because I'm like the president of the uh, of the uh, halfway house by now, right? <laughs> <laughs> and like, so I, 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 I'm being told that selfishness is the root of my problem, so I go up into my room, right, and I think by myself how I can be less selfish, <laughs> right? <laughs> Some of y'all get that. <laughs> Some of y'all like, that sounds like a good idea. Like, how'd it work out? <laughs> Those are probably the new people. <laughs> or maybe the people just visiting, sitting in the lobby, you know? The fact was that, like, I can't get out of myself by doing myself, you know? Alcoholism centers in my mind. I'm told that again and again. I have a physical allergy when I take alcohol. Right? Allergy means an abnormal reaction to an outside agent, which means the majority of people do not have the same reaction to me. I put alcohol in my body. I have the phenomenon of gra- craving. It means I do not know how many th- drinks I'm going to get. The best definition of alcoholism I've ever had or learned is on the open page of We Agnostics, Chapter 4 of our book. It says, if when you honestly want to, you find you cannot quit entirely, or, or, if when drinking you have a little, uh, little control over the amount you take, then you're probably an alcoholic. Now, for me, it's like check and check. But there's an or in there. So you can be one or the other. If you're honest with yourself, maybe you hit on one of them or possibly both. But, like, for me, I was like, yeah, I can get on board with that, man. And I started learning about this allergy. Do you have an allergy? I, have a, I, I react differently to alcohol. And that's how it was, you know. For... Four was a little tricky for me, like it is, I think, for most people, and I balk like most do. And my sponsor set a date for me to finish it, and it was two weeks out, and I showed up two weeks later, and he was like, did you do this like your life depended on it? And I said, no, and he said, we've got nowhere to go then. And uh, and we, we set another date, and I shared a fifth step with that man, and it was a very freeing experience. One, because I knew my sponsor a lot better at the end of the day. Right? He knew a lot of things about me, and I knew a lot of things about him, because the fifth step is a conversation, you know, what I like to tell people today, people ask me, like, what step am I on? And I say, I'm on, I'm on all of them. <laughs> and I don't say that, like, as a prideful dude. I say that because I'm super lucky to have a lot of dudes in my life who are in a lot of different steps. And I'm, when I'm walking with you through a one or a two, I'm in a one or a two. And when I got somebody doing a consistent 10-step work, you're damn sure I'm doing 10 because I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not doing. And if I ask you to get three service commitments because that's what my sponsor asked me to get, then I damn sure better have three service commitments myself. Now, how many meetings are you going to? Because I'm not going to ask you to go to me if I'm not going to meetings. And, um, and, and, and the best thing about this was that my sponsor, I think we're wrapping up here, right? But I'll tell you this. I heard and I believe that the least effective way to communicate the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is verbally. The least effective way to communicate the, the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is verbally. You know, my sponsor would ask me to do things, and then he would turn around and do them. And he would say, I want you to help clean up before this meeting. And then he would be off, shaking hands, and doing service. So I didn't have to listen to him. I saw him. I watched what he did. And I got to watch other people in the rooms just like this who had time, right? Because the people who have three or you know, 30, 60, 90 days who keep coming back, they sit in the back. They don't get service. They don't join AA. That's what I did, right? And the people who have, you know, picking up years are doing service commitments, and sponsoring people, and participating in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, like, if there's anything you could take away from my message, is that just showing up to the gym don't get you fit, you know? And just showing up to Alcoholics Anonymous and putting a dollar in the basket and drinking a, this, the, you know, drinking a coffee don't get you sober. And there'll probably be some people who will go out after this and have some, uh, some like, cakes and crumpets. <laughs> but I, but I, t- uh, I don't know cookies. Oh, okay. But I tell you this too, man. In my experience too, uh, uh, fellowship don't keep me sober either. You know, meetings don't keep me sober either. Meetings allow me to meet new people. One on one interaction with alcoholics keeps me closer to God, and God is what keeps me sober. And if you like me and you have a, uh, some type of um, problem with the word God or the spirituality aspect of this book. It's like Dr. Bob said, man, I feel sorry for you, man. But if you're at a place where you want to try something new, then take a look around the room that people have some time. And if you want what they have, if you want what we have, then maybe just try doing what we do. You know, there's a ton of people in this room who are willing and not only willing, but need to and will go to any lengths to sponsor you because they were sponsored. 
And it's a privilege and an honor to be able to pass this thing down. I'll leave you like this. Alcoholics Anonymous changed my life. There's a ton of places tonight I could be tonight, just like you. But I'm here tonight because there's nowhere else I'd rather be than sitting with y'all in AA because this program completely transformed my life. And I think if you want it, then you can get it too. All right, thank y'all so much for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.